Shaba. Y'all ready? Y'all good? Come on. We ready? Man, I got a word for you this morning, I believe, with all my heart. And uh, um, I'm just going to follow God in this. Man, I've been meditating on so much this week, just uh, just things the Lord's given me. And, and uh, there's one word that keeps coming over and over again. I'm, I'm going to go deeper into that today. You know, it's one thing to know about God, but it's another thing to yield to Him and let Him do His work on the inside of us. A lot of people know about God. A lot of people know scriptures and know things that can describe God, define God. They can debate God. But are we yielded to God? (laughs) The title of this morning's message is, Have You Tried Turning It Off and Back On Again? (laughs) That's the title of this morning's message. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? I know that sounds kind of weird, but... Um, it's important that we understand that God's the one that created all of this, and He's the one that made us, and He knows how things work. And there's only one way for us to be satisfied in this life, and that's to do the things the way that God made us to do them. If, um, if you've ever done any kind of technical support for anybody, you understand that sometimes you've got to ask them to do some things that sound pretty silly. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? And has anybody ever been told that? You called in for an answer on something? Anybody ever ever been told that and you think, seriously? But then you do it and it actually works. And then it's really embarrassing because that was all that you really had to do. or, 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 Or the sweat comes over your forehead whenever you realize, oh my gosh, I've called and I didn't try that. And I know that I should try turning it off and back on again or unplugging it, plugging it back in again. We really don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> we don't, especially Americans. We don't like to be told what to do. We believe in freedom. Yeah. I'm free in Texans. That's right. We were talking to some people that, that they, they were like, what's the deal about Texas? You know, Texas history and Texas this. And te- if, you, if you're not from here, you just don't understand. I can't explain it to you. If you're from Texas, you know, it's just because you're from Texas. But we don't like to be told what to do. We like to make our own decisions, and we call that freedom. I want to do what I want to do. And nobody's going to tell me to do something different. And whether we verbalize that or not, a lot of times that's internal on us on a a lot of things. I know what you're telling me, but I'm not doing that. And the truth is, that carries over into our spiritual life. There are things that I can tell you what the Word of God says, but unless we, we've made the quality decision that we are going to follow Him in whatever He says, it doesn't matter what the Word of God says. It doesn't matter how powerful the Word of God is. It's not powerful in our life if we don't surrender and move toward what He's saying to do. Because we think we can do it a better way. I mean, we'd never say that out loud. We'd never actually say, I can do it better than what God is saying. We just prove it by our actions that we have another way. I don't, or I, I'm exempt. I don't have to do it that way. I know what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying, but, 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 sheep follow goat's butt. Don't be a goat. We need to follow. We need to find out what is God saying about my situation. People will go through so much turmoil in their life, and we call it getting to rock bottom. Sometimes people get to rock bottom before they ever give and surrender to God. Why? Because they've tried it their own way over and over and over and beat their head against the wall. I was watching a video the other day. It was perfect. It was a a goat. And somebody had put up a wall and... There was a steel plate on that wall with a mirror on it. But it was like it was unbreakable kind of reflective metal. And that goat was having him a time. Oh, I am. Oh, I am. And that other goat wouldn't give up. (laughs) And he just kept pounding his head against him, backing up and going at it again. 
And that's what we look like in the spirit sometimes. We just, we're not going to give up. We know that we can do it our way. It's amazing to me how people think that God's word's not relevant for today. You know, many churches don't believe that God is enough. We need a smoke machine and a Nintendo game station. We got to have all this for the kids and we have to have all this for for our entertainment. And where are the light shows and where's the LEDs and how do we get this to manufacture glory that we can't produce? Because no, God's not really relevant today. Look, Jesus is relevant every day. He doesn't go out of style. Sin does not begin to shift according to culture. It's clear. It's clear. It doesn't change like, well, you know, nowadays we, no, 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 nowadays they. Nowadays the world. You think that, you think that the sins of this world are different than it was in the Roman times? If, if they put on the screen what was happening in the Roman times, you wouldn't look at it. You think it's changed? It's not changed. We're not more current now. Nothing new new under the sun. It's the same. Just we're different. We come across as spiritual teenagers. Teenagers, just plug your ears for a second. I'm not talking, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but we've all been there. We know more than our parents know. Until you become a parent, and then it's like, oh my gosh, they aren't as dumb as I thought they were. We know it all because we're teenagers. We know how things should be. Have all the answers. But until we follow God's ways, we don't know what it's like to even be fulfilled. No matter who it is that you look up to that is in that world out there, I guarantee you they have the emptiness on the inside of them they cannot fill. And every amount of money and every amount of fame is not changing it. The depression still comes. The clouds still come. And the show must go on. But they're just like us. Do you remember what it was like before the light came on? Do you remember what the depression was? Do you remember what the anxiety was? Do you remember what it was like to feel empty or to keep searching for something you don't even know what you're searching for? Sometimes when we receive the Lord and we've, we've had him move in, we forget what it was like before. And then the church, quote, begins to judge everybody else, which is real weird to me because he didn't judge us. All we do, I mean, people celebrate the possibility of the sinner getting what's due him. How many of you in this room have been born again more than 20 years? Raise your hand. If you, more than 20 years, raise your hand. That's good. How many of you more than 15? Raise your hand. Should be more. Uh, in case you didn't know that, I went the other way. More than 15 years? <laughs> More than five years. Now, don't vote. We're going to start. Now, how many of you have not been born again for even five years yet? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Nothing to be ashamed of. Let me ask you this. What if Jesus came back six years ago? In the grand scheme of things, six years is nothing. Been gone for thousands of years. Just decided to return in 2018. Before you ever knew him. But in his mercy, we've come to know him and we've forgotten how to extend mercy to those who don't know him yet. As if there's something wrong with them. Isn't that bizarre? What's your point, Pastor? My point is this. We have a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. And we come into the kingdom sometimes and move as mere mortals. We act like the people from before we ever knew him. We don't yield. We don't allow his word to change us enough. We just want the do's and don'ts. And if we can put the checklist out there that we're not doing this and not doing that and not doing this and not doing that, then we're we're good. 
Somewhere along the way, God's trying to transform us so that when we encounter people out there, we don't have to just tell them what Jesus is about. We, we show them what Jesus is about. We show them what he's like. I, I've, I've had testimonies. I, I've heard different ministers give, and, and uh, it's, it's pretty, sometimes it's pretty radical that they'll be traveling or something, and someone come up to them and say, I've never met anybody like you before. They've met thousands of people that go to church. But they'll say, I've never met anybody like you before. What do you mean? I don't know. You just seem loving. You seem kind. Like genuinely kind. We wear passive aggressiveness as a badge of honor. (laughs) Well, I only told them. I just gave them truth. Truth with the attitude of the devil is not truth. (laughs) It's not truth at all. I just gave them, I was giving them water. Yeah, but you were giving them water in a filthy cup. (laughs) It's like, I mean, how would you like it if somebody pulled something out of a trash can and dipped it in water and said, you thirsty? I mean, the water was clean, but the vessel shouldn't have been serving water. I don't know where this is going because I didn't have any of this planned, but we just, just take that for what it's worth. Do we really stop and think that maybe the designer has more understanding of how things operate than we do? I mean, do we stop and really think of that? Let me, let me give you this word that just keeps coming up in my quiet time. And hopefully it will resonate with you. But this keeps coming up to me. And it's in James chapter 1 verse 21. It says this. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility. That's the word that keeps coming up. In humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. In humility, man, that's, I've quoted a lot of times, receive the word, receive the word implanted. It's able to save your soul. It's like a seed. You got to receive it, let it be planted in your heart. But it's the first part that we leave out, which is in humility, receive the word. Because humility prepares the soil. Humility says, I don't know it all. I I don't have it figured out. I'm not God. I've told this story once or twice, but I'll, I was brushing my teeth this morning, and the Lord brought it right back to me. I mean, I could see it as, it as when it first happened. It was a couple of our grandkids. Our grandson, the oldest grandchild, and his little sister when they were little. And my grandson looked at his little sister and said, how you spell cat? C-A-T, stupid. Real st- I mean, he was so proud of himself. I can spell cat. And as soon as he did that, instead of trying to just correct, you don't call her stupid. I, before I could say something out of my mouth, the Lord said, that's you. And I'm like, excuse me? He said, that's what you sound like when you call another human being stupid. Because you think you're so smart. How did I form the world's? How did I create the sea? How did I put everything living inside of it? How do I keep it working the way it is? But you can spell cat. So they're stupid. (laughs) Compared to any other human being on the planet, we can't say, oh, they're stupid. Why do you think the Bible says, don't call a man a fool? Don't call someone stupid. Why do you think he says it? It's like, do you know what you sound like to heaven? They're like, did you hear that little one say that other little one? How do you spell cat? I can spell cat. That's what we sound like to heaven when we look down on someone else. As if we're here and they're way down here. And I promise you in the grand scheme of things, that grandson who could spell cat did not seem that intelligent. And neither do we. Anytime we have not humbled ourselves, but we see that we've attained anything above another, above somebody else. 
we have to, we have to not only learn these scriptures, we have to change. Guys, we have to change. We have to change. We have to walk in humility. We have to go low. When Jesus walked on the earth, he came and was born in a manger, in a little trough that they feed cows out of. The son of the living God decided he would be born in a trough. And when he left, besides the humiliation of the cross and all the stuff that we know that we understand, the last thing he did in his freedom is he put a towel over his arm and washed the feet of his disciples. And it's just become a story. Why don't you grab a towel and kneel down and start washing somebody's feet? And it'll get your attention. When we went to India, one of the things that we did at the pastor's conference is we washed the feet of all the pastors that came. And I'm going to tell you something. Many of them didn't have shoes. And those men couldn't stop weeping. And the whole time you're thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're washing these feet that are just not nice. And the whole time you're doing it and they're weeping, you are thinking, I'm seriously not worthy to wash these feet. Not. I mean, not worthy to wash these feet. I had... We'd go to one pastor's conference and then we'd come back the next year and we would have women run up to us and be like, I'm so glad you're back. We loved the conference last year. Thank you for coming all the way to India to, to minister to us. I'm like, oh, it's good to see you. Where's your husband? Oh, he was martyred. Just over and over. He was preaching at the church and they pulled him out and they burned him in front of everybody so they could get him to shut the church down. But they didn't shut the church down. So they burned the church with them in it. And they're weeping because we're washing their feet. And we're doing a pastor's conference to them. And the whole time we're thinking, you should be teaching us. We're not living what you're living. But we've got some educational stuff for you. We're going to teach you how to prophesy. Do you see how this sounds? I mean, do, do you really see? We think that there's this grid, and when we get to heaven, it's like all the Americans are kind of over in this grid, and it's not going to be like that. There's going to be a whole nation of people. If you're not humbled at that point, you will be humbled when you begin to see real believers. I mean, real believers that are just giving it all, just laid down. Their life is laid down. And, it, and they're looking at you like, what were you? I mean, your, your 30 minutes of prayer this morning was confessions on getting your new car? I mean, seriously? Like, why? I mean, you were that concerned about your job status? And they're like, Seriously? There are people dying and going to hell all around you, and you were just walking through them trying to think how to get a promotion. And they don't understand. They're just, do you understand we're living in these days? This is not, this is not in the Bible times. Today, God is saying, today, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save. You cannot separate that word save. That Greek word means saved, healed, which is able to save and heal your soul your mind, your will, your emotions. All of these things in us, the mind, the will, the emotions, are healed by humbling ourselves and humbly receiving the word and saying, I'm going to live that and not my way. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to take your word and I'm going to ask you, Lord, empower me to live this, not just to quote this. And listen, when you fail, he will not kick you to the side any more than you would kick your child to the side for trying to walk and falling. He'll pick you up and say, that was two steps. Come on. Come on. Give me three. Give me three. You, you can do this. 
you can do this. Our God is not looking for a reason to punish us. He's looking for a reason to celebrate our life. And he's looking for us to understand what it means to feel through every cell of our being. Love, joy, peace. Real peace. To not be tormented in our mind. To have have genuine peace. And he's like, let me show you what my joy is like. I'm going to let you give this away. And then when you give, you're going to find out it's much better to give than receive. It's much better to give than receive. But we live in a society, guys, it's just gone this way, where the teachers teach it's more, it's better for you to give than receive. And they do it in a motivation of you giving to them. Like, you need to give in the offering, guys. It's more blessed to give than receive. You need to give. Toward, it's more blessed to give than receive. And the majority of you that are trying everything in your, in your heart to live this, most of your giving is never seen. Because that's the way it should be. It's not just the offering bowl that he was talking about. He's talking about laying down your life for somebody, buying groceries for the person next door. You see someone on the side of the road with a flat tire, you buy them a new tire. You hear me? It's just, it's not that complicated. There, I, can't, I can't tell you, there are times that I will, I will have what I call my little extra fund. Uh, you know, my extra fund. Sometimes it's for ministering somewhere and they give you an offering and then you report that offering, you pay tax on that offering, you take what's left of that and you say, I'm just going to use this for something. Or you take your birthday money or whatever and we put it in envelopes and I can't tell you, I'll be saving towards something. Expensive, so it's taking a while because I would never take my money, just, I just wouldn't spend it. And I start saving it and then I get about halfway and he's like, cool. I'd give it away. <laughs> but I mean, I was, I was on track for what I'm saving for, and it doesn't matter. I'm not trying to say, y'all do like me. I'm trying to say, I, I live this example with you. I understand that sometimes you're saving up for something, and then God says, now empty your account. Now give it to somebody else. And a person that doesn't understand that will watch someone do that and think, man, that's foolish. Because they're living carnally. They're living by the the principles of this world instead of the principles of the kingdom. You want to guarantee that you will never have enough? Save for just you. Guaranteed you will never have enough. Ever. And you want to guarantee you'll never be satisfied? Live for just you. (laughs) And And the society will cause you to be in this constant state of trying to grasp at something else. You know, I told you, I can watch, listen, the NFL draft just happened. The NFL draft's going on. You know what people are talking about as soon as the NFL draft starts? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl, they just drafted a guy that we don't know if he's going to pull a hamstring next week. We have no idea about anything about this person. But we're talking Super Bowls and who's going to win, who's going to win the East, and who's going to win the West. And, and then you know what happens when they win? The next day, before the parade, who's going to win next year? Will they defend their title? Will they, who's going to be? Are you kidding me? They didn't even get to enjoy it for a moment. I've watched people win NBA championships, be pulled to the side. You're the MVP. You were great. You think you can defend next year? Like, uh, we're trying to just celebrate this one. I haven't touched the trophy yet. That's what this world does to us. Jesus says, look, take your life, give it away, and then you'll have life. Or you can hold on to your life and you'll lose it. You can hold, just grasp it. Just hold on to it with all you have, and it will go through your fingers like water. Or you can just give it away, and it will come back and multiply. The written word of God comes to us in seed form. Mark chapter 4 teaches that. Every word that he's speaking to us, it comes as a seed. 
every word, every, every message you hear, every, every message that's preached to you, everything you read in your quiet time comes into you as a seed at that moment. And it has a chance if it's received in humility. But if it's not received in humility, is there's no intention to just do. How many of you ever prayed this one? God, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And sometimes I just know God's looking around and he's going, bless your heart. No, you won't. <laughs> You're telling me you'll do, but I know. So I'm going to keep working on you. It's time for us to grab a towel. It's time for us to go low. To go low. Because the way up is down, the way down is up in this world. It's just the truth. When you're going to walk in the kingdom, it's going to be opposite of the world. Why do you think there's a lamb continually on the throne? This is the Passover season, the Passover lamb forever on the throne. Forever. Not to remind us of our sin, but to remind us of our redemption. To remind us that he loves and he redeems. The humility prepares the soul of our heart to accept the condition, the conditions of the word. Because we don't like to be told what to do. We have to humble ourselves so that when the word comes, we're like, oh, I'm going to do that. Anybody ever been corrected in front of other people before? <laughs> and there's a nice little, uh, there's a groan in there. All of us have been corrected, right or wrong, in front of people. I've been publicly corrected on a microphone at a conference. That'll, that'll humble you. I did. I was, I was ministering at the front, just talking to a couple, just, and the Spirit of God told me to tell them something to encourage them. They worship. They, they did worship. And the Lord said to them, there are times I know that you feel you don't feel worthy to get on that platform, but I'm telling you, I've washed you and I've cleaned you and you're ready. And they, I'm just encouraging them. And you can see it on their face that God's touching them, right? Their pastor hears it. Now, in the sound of my voice, probably rows one through three might be able to hear me. That's it, out of the whole conference. So he grabbed a microphone. I need to correct something that Sydney just said. Because it was public, I need to say it publicly. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm just like, huh? I'm thinking, what in the world just happened? He made it sound like they're having trouble in their marriage. I'm thinking, I don't know anything about their marriage. I'm just trying to encourage somebody that God's got you. And then he's this whole little thing. Their marriage is fine. They're fine. It's not that they don't feel worthy. Blah, blah, blah. He went through a whole little thing. Okay. And I just stood there. And then I went back to praying. My spiritual papa was there. And I just went back to praying. And then the, we're done. We go back to the green room. And they had food for us and everything. And we went back there to sit and eat. And this pastor had to dismiss himself. And when he did, my spiritual father looked at me and said, Sydney, you were actually right on. And what he brought up about marriage, you were right on about that too, whether you knew it or not. Because they called me last week with trouble in their marriage. And he doesn't know it. And so I'm sitting there going, wow, okay. Hmm. Because I'm telling you, you get humbled. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like I wanted to get under the carpet. You know what happened a few minutes later? Someone knocked on the door of the green room, which you don't do. I don't know if you know this. You don't knock on the door of the green room. The, the, the elites are in there. <laughs> knocked on the door. Said, yes. And then somebody cracked the door up. Excuse me, Pastor. Um, I just want, uh, can Sydney pray for me? <laughs> the pastor who just corrected me has to hear, can he come back? And he goes, well, he can if he goes out there. I said, okay. So I walked back outside, went to the altar, and I said, let's just pray right here. So I started to pray. Well, when I started to pray for him, a line started from here to the back of this room. They just lined up. And I'm like, what in the world? We already prayed for people. They just lined up just like this. And one after another, people are going, you got to get this guy. I'm telling you, God's saying this. this. And so I just started saying stuff to different people. And they're 
busting out laughing. They're roaring laughing because God's hitting the mark. One of those young men I'm, I'm friends with now on Facebook, I didn't, I didn't even remember. I knew it was a person, and I had said something about, I see you with youth, I see you with this, I see, and, I'll, and everybody's roaring because he's a youth pastor, and I didn't know. We're friends on Facebook. He messaged me just about a month or two ago. I bet you don't remember, but you were at this place in this city, in this state, and he's going on, and I'm going, I remember. <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> but you said this over me. And this is what's come to pass. And I'm just like, see, God will watch over you, but sometimes he'll still let you get humbled to see how are you going to, because I could have defended myself. I could have got an attitude, went to my papa, did you hear what he said? Or when he says, hey, you were right. Well, you need to correct him then. Well, can you publicly validate me? Just let it be. Just let it be. Because God's more interested in what he does in us than what he does through us. He's more interested in, in who we become in our character than, than how we are in our comfort. We teach a comfort gospel. It's all about happiness, joy, peace. And my Bible says there were those who were burned at the stake, sawn in two, people that died for this gospel, that the world was not worthy of them. And we amen it, and then someone just says something bad about our character. <coughs> I'm not friends with them. I'm disliking them on Facebook. So that's it. <laughs> I don't want to be associated with them. Anybody even ask me, I just, I'm just going to put a warning out. Because surely God thinks the same about them as I do. Sometimes it actually takes pain, difficulty, and even despair to bring us to the place of surrender. That's not God's plan, but that's his mercy because he never gives up on you. I've been to the place of despair, despairing of life itself. I have been to the place where I have said, God, it would have been better for everybody else if I had not been here. I would rather just not be here. I've prayed that prayer many times. I've been at the lowest of the low. And I've also been at places where I've, look, we, we sang a song earlier, Jeremiah 33. And I have a friend, if she sings that song, you can't tell if it's the recording of this or her. I'm telling you, you can't tell. When I played it, Kathy goes, how'd you get that recording of her? I said, that's not her. Oh. And I watched that woman die of cancer. Some of y'all may get tired of worship. You know, we get up here, we worship for a while. I know 45 minutes has got to be excruciating <laughs> to worship God for 45 minutes. But we worshiped with them every Friday night for four hours. Every Friday. That was normal. Four hours. That was worship. And then she's gone. But today when I hear that song, I don't mourn. Today when I hear this song, I think, she's watching. She's what? We're still worshiping. We're still worshiping the king, just like you are. Because she's in the cloud of witnesses now. She's on the bleachers. <laughs> Come on, you can do this. When you get here, you're not going to believe how amazing it is here. Don't mourn me. <laughs> I got to watch you still be on earth, you poor thing. Don't mourn me. I'm almost finished, I promise. Our stubbornness causes us to reap a harvest, a harvest that could be avoided. In our stubbornness, we reap harvests at times that could be avoided. What do you mean by that? I mean, when we refuse to do the will of God, like, I know God says to do this, to repent, but mm, then we reap a harvest of that, that we could avoid. Yeah. 
I wrote something on Facebook this week that because I, I heard this from Brian Britton and it stuck with me. He was telling me about a pastor's office and the pastor's office had a picture on the wall. And the, on the wall was a picture of a cross and on the cross it said S-E-L-F. Self was on the cross. And he said, when people walk into the pastor's office for counseling, it solves a lot of the problems of counseling right there. <laughs> because if we will just do that, it solves a lot of issues. It's self that gets us in trouble. It's trying to get our way. It, self will not lay its life down for the, for the other. Self will not... Husbands, love your wives. What does that mean? That means period. Love. Got a good amen over here, but listen, listen to this. Women, honor your husbands. Ooh. So everything you're saying, doing, and demonstrating is honor, right? No, I got another way of doing it. I got a better way. I give him what he deserves. Oh, it's a good thing that we all get what we deserve, right? If I curl your toes in real quick, just for a minute, just curl your toes in. <laughs> Humility takes the person that you believe dishonored you and causes you to wash their feet. Jesus didn't wash the feet of his disciples and get to Judas and go, mm, mm, mm. I know what you're about to do. I ain't washing those feet. He washed, their, he washed Judas's feet the same as everybody else, exactly the same. That's why when he said someone will betray me, they're all going, who? They didn't all, they didn't all go, we know. Judas, Judas, Judas. They didn't know. He did all the same miracles they did. He prophesied just like they did. He got his feet washed just like they did. And Jesus never called him out publicly one time. And he was a thief. A deceiver. Faking it. And selling Jesus out for coins, money, he sold out the Son of God. Jesus never even, he did tell him, it'd be better that the man that does this wouldn't even born. But he didn't call him out and say, everybody, watch out for Judas. See, we're, we're discerning people. So if we think there's a Judas in the church, we'd be, we'd be sure and pass that along. You might want to stand clear of them because I'm telling you, there's things about them you just don't know. I don't know. When I get around them, I get this feeling. It just doesn't feel quite right. I've been hearing that for years and years and years. I don't know. I get around her. I feel witchcraft on her. I think she's got witchcraft. So what, what do you do? Let's just put a little barrier up so no witchcraft gets out. <laughs> We're so foolish. But if Jesus was standing right here and a witch walked in and just pretending to be one of us, I guarantee you, he would hug him. He would embrace him. He would love him. And if there was some foot washing to be done, he wouldn't pass him by. But we isolate people because we're sure we have discernment. I see how you can love people into the kingdom, but I don't think when we try to isolate them and make fun of them and tell people to stand clear of them, I don't think that really gets them in the kingdom. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance, and they don't know the goodness of God when we're just isolating people and treating them like a clique. I'll keep going. That wasn't part of my message. It's just kind of happening. There was one thing. I'm going I'm to leave you with this. One story, just more about along the line of, of humbling ourselves and obeying. Not deep. You can, you can put your toes back out, won't step on your toes. Just like stretch your feet. It's all going to be good. But there was a man named Naaman. He was a leper. And he was a, a warrior. He was, he was a tough man. And he had leprosy. And he heard from a little girl. If he was among the prophets of Israel... He could be healed. And so he went to the king and said, is it okay if I go to Israel? Because I want to I get healed. The king said, yeah, you can go. So he, he does. He, he heads toward it, and he, shows, he sends word to the king that he's coming. 
I'm coming to get healed. The king tears his garments and is frustrated and scared. Like, Why is this warrior coming here to me as if I can heal him? The man never said, you're going to heal me. He just said, I'm coming to get healed. I'm coming to get healed. So the prophet tells the king, don't worry about it. Naaman's about to learn that there's a prophet in Israel. This is what it says in 2 Kings 5, 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And then he says, are not, he starts naming, naming rivers in his land. Are not these rivers better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. He came with all of his chariots and horses, and he came with his other soldiers and backup, and he, all his entourage. And he pulled up, and the prophet said, hey, man, just go out there and tell him to go wash in the water. The prophet didn't even come to answer the door. Oh, he was mad. He was dishonored. And he went away in a rage, it says. And then it says, Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And I counsel people every day just like that. This is what you need to do. Oh. But if I'd have told them something great, if you spend 14 days in a fast, you cry out to the Lord 72 times reading these verses, then you shall be free. Oh, they'll do it. But you say, you need to love your wife. Oh. I've been doing that. I told her I loved her when I married her. If I change my mind, I'll let her know. <laughs> and, but we're not going to do it God's way. Honor your husband. I just need an honorable husband. I'll just trade this one for an honorable one, and I'll do that. <laughs> just laugh. The word's powerful, guys, but are we receiving it? And we're not receiving it if we're not receiving it in humility. Not my way, Lord, but your way. Not my will, but your will. But we'll sing it. Where you go, I go. What you say, I say. And what you pray, I pray. And what you pray, I pray. We'll sing it. Okay, God says, say this. I'm not saying that to him. He was a jerk. <laughs> We're just going to be miserable. Well, let's just be miserable. We don't know that our repercussions affect generations. Right. You're not affecting your decision. Your decision is not just you. I'm, go I'm not going to do that. Well, it's going to affect you and your children and your children's children. Because you've decided, it doesn't matter what God said. I'm not doing that. And we would never say that we're shaking our fist at God, but we're shaking our fist at God. I'm not doing it that way. And it's the answer. People say, well, I tried that. Oh, well, if you tried it, then you're exempt. You tried it twice. <laughs> I mean, you take a prescription for six months. I'm sorry. I said to put your toes back out. Listen, listen. Put your
Put your flip-flops back on. We're going to just wiggle our toes. I have this chiropractor that I went to. I only, went, only have one that I really ever, you know, he, I had a compression area, and he decompresses you with something called a ring dinger. You can look it up on YouTube. And they put, a, they put this thing around your neck, towel around your neck. And then they put these rods on the sides of your hips, and they lodge them in there. You can't move. And then they elevate your feet up. And then he says, don't bite your tongue. Put your teeth together. Boom! And he jerks that thing around your neck. And he pulls you. And you feel about 72 crackles that go from the base of your skull all the way down the bottom of your pelvis. And then when you finish, you feel really, really, really weird and not good. And, it's just, and the first thing he does, because your legs are elevated, he goes, wow! And you, you just think, I just got my neck broke. And he walks over like this and he goes, tink! And he taps your knee and your, he goes, okay, your legs still work. <laughs> You're like, well, that's a relief. Thank you. I feel much better now. Your legs still work. But he does. So he whack, he checks. Boom. Okay. <laughs> it's not comforting. <laughs> but effective. Sometimes you've got to go through some painful situations to get relief. Sometimes you've got to humble yourself and say, I don't have the answer, but I believe God does. And I'm not just going to seek God for his blessing. I'm not going to seek him just for money. I'm not going to seek him for favor. I'm not going to seek, I'm going to seek him to know what his will is. And to obey. Because he's not just the king. He's Lord and master. And so I do what he says. And I live the way he says. And, and I found out it's the best way. Stand up with me please. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? A spiritual ring dinger. <laughs> what out? I dare say... To all of us within the sound of my voice, please listen to this. You may go back to God with a serious situation going on in your life, and he just might give you a very simple answer. The answer is simple, but extremely difficult. Because when God says, I've got your answer, I can heal this today, go to that one. Who wronged you, who's guilty, and apologize to him. <laughs> Let this cup pass from me, Lord. There has to be another way. <laughs> but that's how God works. Sometimes he'll give us the answer, and it's simple, but it's real difficult to do it. Lord, we want you. And we want to be like you, and we want to be effective in the earth, and we want people to know you, and we don't want to be the hindrance. So God, please, in your mercy, in your grace, in your compassion, speak, Lord, to us exactly what you want us to do. And Lord, we give you our yes before we even hear what you're telling us to do. We give you our yes. We didn't know what you would require of us when we gave our life to you, and we gave you a yes. And we refuse to take it back. So, Lord, make us more like you. Thank you for your mercy on our lives. Thank you for all, all, all the times you forgave us. You extended mercy. You never left us, even when we were jerks. You didn't leave us, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.